Should you care about Harrison Butker's right-wing culture war commencement speech? Yes and no. First, I'm gonna briefly recap the situation, then touch on how I think this is a culture war story that non-Catholics could mostly ignore. Second, I'll touch briefly on Christian alternatives to such a worldview. Third, conservative counter-reactions to his speech actually bring up really interesting family questions that have been addressed by decades of careful research, and those are worth considering. And finally, cultural competency and training among therapists offers, I think, some insight here. So, okay, what happened? Harrison Butker, kicker for the Kansas City Chiefs, recently delivered a controversial commencement speech at Benedictine College focused on gender roles, queer pride, DEI initiatives, birth control, and more. This speech was routinely posted online by the school, but has since gone viral, igniting an online firestorm of liberal backlash and conservative backlash to that backlash. Butker is clearly a conservative Catholic culture warrior, with a bunch of views that I sharply disagree with. Here's a partial list. I disagree that women have been told, quote, diabolical lies about having careers. I disagree that there is widespread emasculation of men in our culture. I disagree that pride in one's queer sexual orientation is a, quote, deadly sin. I disagree that IVF and surrogacy are, quote, disordered ways of playing God. I could go on, but you get the point. I disagree with him on a lot of issues. I think a lot of the strong reaction on the left is because portions of his speech read like something you might hear at a Turning Point USA conference, Charlie Kirk's evangelical political organization with specific right wing policy aims. But that highlights the fact that this was not a speech at a political rally. It was much closer to a sermon given at a church. Conservative Catholics choose to go to conservative Catholic schools who then choose conservative Catholic speakers for their graduation ceremonies. I agree with journalist and author Bonnie Christian that this speech featuring a Super Bowl winning athlete should never have been put online for public consumption. It is essentially protected religious speech given in a religious setting to a religious group. This speech includes remarks about the mass being spoken in Latin. I mean, come on, this is inside baseball. Now, some Benedictine nuns whose group has been associated with the school have released a statement saying that his comments do not represent all Catholics or Benedictines. Great. I am happy to let the Catholics sort this one out in-house. But as I said, one of the topics I cover regularly on the UF Permission podcast is the wide array of options within Christianity. Butker and his ilk represent the current right wing of Catholicism. But Catholicism is a big tent Christian denomination. The public disavowal by those nuns is a good example of this. Members of religious orders in Catholicism, like the Benedictines, Jesuits, and the Franciscans, tend to be more left-leaning and theologically progressive than the average Catholic. Father James Martin, for instance, is a very public and well-known advocate of queer inclusion in the Catholic Church. Many of Pope Francis's statements and writings over the years have pushed the Catholic Church leftward on these and other issues, in part leading to the rightward backlash of Harrison Butker and other so-called trad Catholics, trad being short for traditional, hence the Latin Mass. Outside of Catholicism, in America, we're all very familiar with conservative evangelical Protestants and their overwhelming support for Donald Trump. But there are also liberal or progressive Christian denominations that affirm queer sexuality and gender identities, that lean heavily into scientific consensus on all manner of issues, that ordain women and fight for gender equality, that focus on social justice issues, etc., etc. Such churches might be Episcopal, United Church of Christ, Church of Canada, many of the Evangelical Lutheran, United Methodist, or Presbyterian Church in America, um, or Quaker churches bunch of smaller denominations. These are generally called mainline Protestant churches. The easiest way to find one of these churches, if you're interested, is to use the map function at gaychurch.org. Yeah, don't go to gaychurch.com. Don't know where that will take you. <laughs> okay, now to this point about research and some of the counter reactions. So some of these reactions actually bring out some really interesting and important issues, and there's some research about them. For instance, here is a clip from the conservative Christian YouTubers, Paul and Morgan. 
there are people out there who are making 40000 35000 a year on one income, sacrificing, choosing to sacrifice that second income because they believe it is that important for the woman to stay home with the children and raise those kids up. The lie that has been spoken over women. Get it, prego mama. And men <laughs> is wild. It, it doesn't make any sense, you guys, for women to go to work and that your income as a woman is literally going to pay for your child's daycare. But if you just stayed home, you wouldn't have to pay for daycare. Your child would be way more stable and would be poured into every day by you and the father when he gets home from work. Like So Morgan is right that many families choose to sacrifice income for the benefits of having a parent raise the children. Now, interestingly, some of those parents are men. Some some families choose that the woman who has a better job will work and the dad will stay home. So it's not always gendered. Um, but the caption on their Instagram post from this video mentions uh, some specific financial decisions that many of these families make. They might choose to downsize the home, go to one car, things like this. I know personally a family uh, from our home church that decided a long time ago that the husband was not going to pursue sort of the corporate ladder. He was being offered promotions, offered promotions, and he said, you know what? We're going to rent our home. We're going to live here as long as we can. I'm going to prioritize time with my children, and we want the wife to stay home uh, and, and mother the kids. I, I think that that's like countercultural in Seattle where I live to like leave money on the table for family purposes. I actually really... I think that was a great call. Uh, you see it in their family, I think. These can be values-based decisions that rub against the more, more, more of late-stage capitalism. And as an individual, as a Christian, as a therapist, I'm here for it. But it gets a little dicier with Morgan's claim that children raised by a homemaker are, quote, way more stable and that children need their mothers more or less as many hours per day as possible. Now, the effects of daycare have been studied a fair bit over the last 40 years or so. According to Emily Oster at Parent Data, the results are mixed. There seems to be a cutoff around the 18-month mark, with slight cognitive costs for children enrolled in daycare before 18 months, slight cognitive benefits for those enrolled 18 months or later. There are some negative behavioral effects for both groups, especially for the younger enrollees, but all these effects are small and they appear to fade to nothing by later childhood. This is uh, this comes from a longitudinal study that checks in with the kids and the families over many years. A more substantial finding um, with with more research or more studies is that better quality daycare is associated with better outcomes for children. Now, that's not surprising. This is a really tough subject to study directly. For instance, you can't do randomized control trials because it is unethical to put some children and families in the control group that doesn't get any of the thing that you're thinking might benefit them. So you have to kind of look for this in, in more creative ways. One way to do that is by looking at parental leave findings around the world. So research on this finds no real benefit after four months or so, meaning that mothers or fathers whose parental leave from work allows them more time at home with the children, sometimes up to a year, like in Scandinavian countries, um, this does not on the whole lead to better outcomes for children who only had four months of parental leave. So this is from the fourth to the 12th month or so of the child's life. Now this hints that there's not all that big of a difference between mom or dad staying home and baby needing some kind of daycare. In other words, the right-wing cultural script that liberal society is destroying our children through enrolling women in the workforce does not have a strong empirical backing. As a therapist, this makes me want to prioritize the values and goals of an individual person or family. What do they want? What do they value? What do they think would be best for their particular child or children? I'll use my family as an example. My wife has chosen to largely stay home with our two boys. She also has a side hustle, and we still do utilize partial daycare for our oldest a few days per week. Now, we did not decide this because God or because Western social decay. We chose it because it felt best and still feels best for our family, so we're sticking with it. There's one more angle that I find interesting as a therapist. 
cultural competency and variety. So when it comes to our clients' religious beliefs or cultural practices that might appear to us as therapists either overly strict and conservative or overly lax and progressive, we are trained to be flexible and non-judgmental, as well as to look for practices and beliefs that are common within that culture. So this would apply to me seeing a client from a collectivist conservative culture like Mexico, a trad Catholic in the U.S., or a polyamorous anarchist Wiccan in downtown Seattle. It's not helpful to the therapeutic alliance or the therapeutic work to try and convince these clients to break from their own traditions. And I think that there is a wider wisdom here as well for the rest of us. Let the trad Catholics be trad Catholics because publicly shaming them or telling them they suck is not going to work. Now, if they start to force young people to stay trad Catholics, all right, now we're getting into consent territory. Now we're getting into rough waters. But these are people who have chosen to go to this college, have stayed long enough to graduate and be at the commencement address. That's their right. If you, like me, disagree with their worldview, great, model something better and invite them to be a part of that life to the extent that that makes sense.